This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Hello, my friends, and welcome to this special episode of Coffee with Kenobi. You are about to hear audio from the Star Wars Visions press junket that I was fortunate to be a part of. Myself and a number of Star Wars journalists were able to interview James Waugh, the executive producer of Star Wars Visions, and Kanako Shirasaki, who is a producer on Star Wars Visions. They were able to share their insights into the making of this incredible nine episode season star wars visions is tremendous there's going to be so much coverage you can certainly find the spoiler free review on coffee with kenobi's website that i was able to post a little bit ago and then later this week holly fry from full of sith and james burns from jedi news join me as we take a more in-depth approach at looking at these episodes specifically but for now let's jump into the star wars visions press junket pull up a chair grab your favorite coffee mug And let's have some coffee with Kenobi. So the first question that was asked for the Star Wars Visions Press Roundtable was from another Star Wars podcast. The hosts are Melissa and Matt Thomas. And Melissa wanted to know when the idea for Star Wars Visions came up, what was it like to blend the two or was it much more seamless than originally anticipated? And as I said at the top of the show, James Waugh and Kanako Shirasaki are the two that are talking and sharing their insights for these questions themselves? Yeah, that, that's that's a great question. I, I I think in truth, it was actually pretty seamless. And what I mean by that is so much of Star Wars is influenced by uh, a, a similar uh, cinematic language as, as anime. And, and a lot of that is Kurosawa and Jadageki films and, and, you know, a lot of Japanese cinema. And so uh, I think in many ways, these things really spoke, like harmonize and, and to, to that point, I think we've been inspired by anime for a long time. I, I don't think it's any secret that a lot of our a lot of our work, it's very clear that, you know, there is a deep love for uh, Japanese animation at Lucasfilm. There has been for a long time, um, uh, George included. And so I think, you know, it, it was not w- the 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 challenge was really more about finding the excavating the Star Wars heart and soul and and making sure that when we say what is anime, each of these stories and each of these studios really tell uh, have a different tone and a different feel. And, um, you know, it really hopefully paints like the broad swath of like all the diversity you get with anime. Um, so it was really just finding the heart and soul of each of one of these stories and helping these creators uh, tell the best Star Wars story that was as authentic as possible. But, uh, you know, at its core, I think the imaginative world building of Star Wars is very similar to what uh, anime creators are doing. And this, the, the very visual cinematic uh, language and, and action sequences uh, that anime um, is known for is very similar to what Uh, George was doing and we've carried forward in uh, current Star Wars storytelling. Yeah, definitely. I agree because it's all the creators are hugely influenced by Star Wars. So, and then they love Star Wars so much. So when we're talking about the story and ideas, like they know what they want to do and then they know what's the uh, essence of the Star Wars universe. Um, So yeah, so it's pretty seamless. Yeah, and it was very interesting. Uh, we have a very great conversation go back and forth between the studios in the production. Yeah, and they they were all, I mean, that's a good point, Kanako. Like literally every conversation we'd sit down and I felt, I felt, you know, a kindred spirits because the conversation usually started with the director talking about, oh, I saw, you know, Star Wars 1977 in the theater, or I saw Phantom Menace, in, you know, in, in, in the theater in 1999, and it changed my life. And I realized I wanted to do that, too. And I wanted to create worlds like that. And, you know, it's kind of it's that moment of like, oh, yeah, I, I know that feeling, <laughs> you know, and everybody that I think, you know, touches Star Wars knows that feeling. Then it was my turn, so I'll just let myself ask my question. Here we go. Wonderful. Thank you so much, James and Kanako. Pleasure to chat with you this evening or this day or wherever we are in our time zones. Uh, so 
speaking from a point of mythology, is there a particular thematic element of the Star Wars mythology that you thought would lend itself beautifully to Star Wars and anime? Uh, gosh, you know, I, I, the, that's tricky in the sense that I don't think there's one specific story. I think each of, I think a lot of these different stories tell mythic Star Wars stories that could that fit anywhere within Star Wars storytelling. A good example is The Elder. Uh, it is uh, masters and student stories or as Star Wars as it gets. Um, and understand it, passing back the knowledge and having to train as his uh, uh, Star Wars as it gets. And, and, and you know, seeing the difference in generations. Uh, on the other hand, something like a Tatooine Rhapsody is a story about a dreamer and found family. Um, you know, uh, that's Luke Skywalker. He's a dreamer who finds a family. And same as, you know, it's, it's rebels. Uh, you, you know, that, so all of these stories have human stories. Uh, Toby one is a story about, it's a Pinocchio story. It's a, you know, it's a boy that wants to grow up to a droid that wants to grow up and be a real Jedi. Um, so they're all mythic is the, the truth. And I think that's why they're authentic Star Wars stories. We approach it from that place first. What is the basic? And look, we we have the, the the benefit of working with people like Dave Filoni and the, the, the people who have like been here a long time and uh, have passed on their knowledge. Um, so, you know, we get to pay it back, pay it forward. Up next was Sandra from Fangirls Going Rogue, and she wanted to know what the creative parameters were for looking at and creating these individual episodes themselves. So it was very uh, open to, yeah. And we ask them to please explore your imagination and tell your uh, perspective and then tell your uh, own story in Star Wars Galaxy. And that's how we see, uh, that's the idea we received. So we were fortunate that every single director gave us like very distinctive ideas and perspective and their interpretation of Star Wars stories. Yeah, I, we wanted it to be a celebration of Star Wars on anime. Really, we we, you know, uh, I, whether if they wanted their stories to fit more on the timeline, like something like a Tatooine Rhapsody, um, you know, we worked with them to to uh, to help them make it feel like it's plausible and could fit into that. But we didn't want to lead from that place. We didn't want them to try to tell stories that were going to define uh, core Star Wars fiction. We wanted to really let them tell their stories and create new characters. And, you know, certain stories like a Tatooine Rhapsody has a Boba Fett and a Jabba, but really they earn those characters and Bib, but they earn those characters because the, their characters are so good. And it kind of warrants leveraging these other characters. Um, but no, it was very free. Up next was Mark Newbold from Fanthatrax, and he wanted to know what was the basically original idea for bringing Japanese storytelling to life through Star Wars visions? And could this possibly open up the door to other exciting projects like this? Uh, passion, love of the medium. Uh, it truly was that. I mean, I, 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 this certainly wasn't a cynical, like, oh, anime is popular. This was, we love anime. And like, we, we were looking for ways to, to do that. Uh, and like I said before, we, we didn't really know how to do that. Uh, in in this sort of world, the star in a very feature driven world. But when Disney Plus uh, became Disney Plus, and we saw that opportunity coming, and it was a whole new platform, we realized we could explore different types of storytelling um, and uh, lean into anime, which is something we loved. Um, it just happens to be a growing form, I think, because people are discovering what artistry is 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 there. Um, Will this beget further future anime things? I mean, you know, I, I let's see the reaction. I, I'm hoping people love it as much as Kanaka and I uh, do, and we'll know more hopefully next week. To provide some context for you, when James says that, he actually was referring to this week because this press conference was actually the week before Star Wars Visions came out. But up next, we have Brian Young from Full of Sith. Brian wanted to know that in addition to Kurosawa, what are some of the lesser known influences that led to some of the moments and stories in Star Wars Visions themselves? Yeah, I, I would, uh, I just, just because you mentioned Dave, I'll, I'll, I'll riff a, a second. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to work with him uh, over the last number of years 
you know, I, I, not as much as I, I, I would love, uh, but, you know, the, I have learned a lot. And what I have learned from him is that he focuses on what's a story you could tell, or what I've found is he focuses on a story of what could you tell without the Star Wars first? What's a relatable human story? And then from there, we can we can look at what makes it Star Wars and how do you layer on the Star Wars. Uh, the other thing he talks about a lot, and I, I think you see in this, is, is genre films and um, you know what were the influences of Star Wars. Um, and Kanaka, I'm sure you could speak to this more too, but each of these studios are pretty steeped in cinematic like verbiage like they they've seen all the they've seen all the films and so like they had a point of view and hopefully you can see that in uh, Akakiri and the duel and it, you can probably reference those films uh, that they're riffing off of yeah I think each director's you know as they are super excited uh, working on this Star Wars project at the same time they didn't really overwhelm by like you have to make a Star Wars uh, story I think they d uh, bring their very unique perspective to each short like village fry like director want to bring uh the ritual like a more like a japanese like animism type of uh concept to the story and touching rhapsody uh the director kimura like he's really young and he wanted to bring this like a rock rock band concept so they're not shy about bringing their own perspective and what they really want to tell on the plot star wars platform so I think that's that's also another reason why it's worked pretty well, I think. Up next is James Burns from Jedi News. And James, of course, will be joining me later in the week to review these episodes more closely. But he wanted to know about bringing in the Star Wars sound and music into these episodes. And then also asked as a follow-up, will we get any releases of these great new scores themselves? Go ahead, Kanako, you should, yeah. Oh, sure. So I'm glad you brought up the set music and the sound. Uh, so music, like we did in our studio to like, you have to find these type of uh, composers. They went to find like the best composer works for their shorts. Uh, some of the shorts like Village Bride and um, like a duo like explore the combination of orchestra and Japanese traditional music. The Ninth Jedi as like the two composer units are heavily inspired from John Williams. So they are like entire music is like an homage to John Williams. And like Akakiri, the sound is like from the, uh, by a composer called Yuzan. And he play, he's a Japanese and he plays the Indian drum called Tabra, which adds very interesting pers perspective to the Star Wars uh, music. Uh, for the sound perspective, uh, the all the lightsaber sound you hear is from this uh, Lucasfilm sound library. So it's authentic lightsaber sound, as he might have noticed. And some of the shorts did the sound mixing session with Skywalker sound. So that's also enhanced uh, the authenticity <laughs> in a way. And yeah, I'm sure you will find like, lots of interesting findings uh, as you repeatedly watch the short. <laughs> And I hope you enjoy that. Up next is Chris from the Force.net, and he wanted to know if any of the characters for Star Wars Visions were created specifically with key actors in mind for the English dubs of the episodes themselves. No, I, I mean, we, our whole development and production philosophy on this was we wanted to really ensure authentic Japanese anime. Uh, and what I mean by that is we let the, the studios cast a, a, a original cast first, a Japanese cast. Uh, this is the sub versus dub debate you hear often in the anime community. Uh, but, it, it, you know, that rendered the uh, initial uh, expression. What we ended up doing is knowing that we you know, the, we wanted to make this as accessible as possible and we wanted to give people the option for the authentic original experience, but also have a, a, a version that was uh, for people who didn't want to read, uh, uh, you know, the, the movie or, or experience it in, in another language. And so we did what, what has been done with Miyazaki films and, a, you know, a ton of anime is, is, is dub it. Um, uh, and so, no, none of the characters were created in with specific actors in mind. What I will say is that, you know, 
actors or artists and they have their own uh, renditions of characters and they read characters in a different, you know, in their own kind of way, director regardless. And like they have their own, you, you want to lean into their talent. And so some of the English actors express the character slightly different. Uh, in a more new, a different way than than you would see in the uh, the, the the Japanese version, um, and you know it, it, it's really cool to see. Uh, frankly, it's um, but none of them were created for these actors. I think what was exciting is a lot of these actors joined the project because they loved Star Wars and and just as much they loved anime. Another Star Wars podcast wanted to know about what was different about the preparation for this project compared to other Lucasfilm works. No, I mean, that, that that's a really good question. I, uh, you know, again, this kind of goes back to the, to what I was saying before you, you approach these stories, I think from what's a good story and who's the creator and how do you help the creator realize their vision? I don't, you know, we're not addicted. We don't really dictate uh, at, at this company. We're not prescriptive. We believe in talent. And uh, I think, our goal is to always to make sure that talent storytelling is as best as it could possibly be. And we work with them. Um, no matter the medium, every medium has a different kind of form and challenge. I think the thing that was a little different uh, with this e- e- expression or this project in particular is the visions framework is the idea of, you know, <laughs> it's it sometimes when you're, when you're dealing more with core fiction, it's uh, okay. What part of the timeline are we on? How do we, how do we make this work so that the context of that era uh, facilitates the story? And, and it's a, it's a dialogue in that regard. We got there with some of these stories, but that's, that wasn't what led it. It was, we wanted to, we wanted to let these creators just explore anything that was exciting to them and influenced them over 40 years of star Wars storytelling. So there, there were creators that said my star Wars was Knights of the Old Republic. Oh, wow. That really blew me away. I want to use elements of that. Okay, that's that, that that's totally fine. And there were creators that wanted to stay more in the pocket of kind of traditional, like you know, uh, the original trilogy. Um, so it was really more of uh, from that perspective. I think that was the difference. Really, is it wasn't so. Ha- it didn't. The timeline art discussion didn't frame the context. It was lean into the animation first. What kind of what what do you want to say? What do you want to do? And then we'll see how we can. Um, adjust but yeah i mean i don't know i i I, it always comes down to like what's a good what's a good story what what is the story trying to say so watching all these episodes there really truly are not enough superlatives every single episode could be its own series in and of itself and no one would complain because they're magnificent but we gotta talk about tatooine rhapsody and that incredible rock anthem maybe the most significant piece of music since john williams composed anything people are going to go nuts for this thing i just want to hear about the creation of that magnificent tune oh man yeah so uh, i think the director wants you to do uh some 70s garage band feeling uh, <laughs> so i think what they had in mind was uh the crash i uh, forgot the exact uh, song, but um, yeah, so he wanted to recreate that feeling. I think they, yeah, nailed it. <laughs> yeah, very Ramonesy. It's it's super. Yeah, Ramones, sir. Yeah, very um, super cool. Well, what I mean, both versions are cool. So this is another uh, watch the sub and the dub because the 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 sub definitely has the, the original sort of Japanese version. But one of the things that was super exciting was Joseph Gordon Levitt loved the short and part of what he, he was excited about doing was to sing that song and to do his version of that song in the end. It's the same, same song, but man, he sang his, notes. that was the coolest VO session I think I've ever experienced because it was just watching him, you know, just fall in love with it and rock. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. It's a super catchy. I think that guy's got a real future. Yeah, on <laughs> places. Sandra from Fangirls Going Rogue wanted to know which episode resonated the most with Kanako and James. She was very clear in saying, not your favorite necessarily, but which one resonated the most. Oh, Kanako, I'm giving it to you. I mean, you, you I'll give you more time to. Uh, yeah, uh, when I 
whenever I watch the any like movies and I want I want to imagine like what's the other characters doing behind this like a main story. So from that perspective, like I really love watching the Village Bride. Uh, they introduce lives and like different ritual uh, of the people living in the planet Kelia. And I, I was really fascinated by the, all the like designs. Uh, so yeah, I love watching that short from that perspective. Yeah, it's definitely hard to pick the favorite. So thanks for that question. Like, <laughs> Yes, thank you for raising it that way. Like, they're also different and that's part of the that's part of the charm of the way we, we partner with these studios is that they we pick them because they're different. So I have different favorites for different reasons. Um, what resonates with me the most? I don't know. Yeah, I would say Tatooine Rhapsody uh, because of the song, obviously. But uh, it's also was one of those breakthrough moments in the uh, production of, uh, a, you know, I we got uh, this all started with a couple paragraphs. Right. It was like a paragraph on a white paper. You didn't really get a sense of what the storytelling was going to what it was going to look like. And I just remember reading their intention that they wanted to do a rock opera. And I think was I really wasn't sure about that. <laughs> and they, well, they did have one little sketch of the kind of cheaty design of Boba Fett. Um, and it was one of those moments where I was just like, I don't know if this is visions. And I don't, I, and then the more I thought about it, the more I realized like, no, that, you know, we're talking people like Josh Rhymes and other people at Lucasfilm who were part of the project. Ooh, you know, is it, let, maybe this is what visions is. Maybe it is about taking leaps and when you can have a rock song in the end. Um, and so uh, I'm glad I, I'm glad I got on board. Uh, Cause uh, I think that's, that short really speaks to me in the end. Mark from Fanthatrax wanted to know about the differences between the Japanese performance and delivery of the dialogue versus the English dub, and if that played any kind of a key difference, or was it a point of interest when casting for both the Japanese and English dub versions? I don't, I mean, when it came to the English dub, I don't really think that 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 was necessarily, we didn't have that concern, Mark. It wasn't, um, we weren't casting for that, I think to the to the answer earlier, each of these actors sort of in, in embodied the character in their their own way. They did see the original, and I think obviously they were very influenced by that. But I think they also, you, you know, they 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 all have their own thing that they do, and um, they brought that to it. Holly wanted to know that since all these episodes use some pretty powerful themes from the Star Wars saga, the mythology that we know and love so much. Did they have to be careful not to make sure there was too much overlap or did everything kind of fall together in an organic way? It happens organically. We were so lucky when we received all the pitches. It's, it's very different and distinctive. Every single one was unique. Yeah, and I think where they do overlap, it, it's because they get Star Wars. I mean, we're all kind of talking about the same things that appeal to us about this franchise and it's not to say that it won't evolve and there's not other interesting things that can be done but like the heart and soul of the storytelling is so rooted in 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 the star wars that we all know and love and and i think that that was the same for these creators you know so those mythic themes um is what they kept coming back to uh hopefully they're expressed in enough different variety that it, it's not one note, uh, but it, you know, I, I think some of those, some of those similarities are because it's Star Wars and they're authentic stories. Again, that was Holly's question. Holly, of course, from Full of Sith, who will also be joining me on Thursday to break down all these episodes with James. Speaking of James, James is up next and he asks an interesting question that you will know the answer to if you're listening to this when it drops, but he wanted to know if there will be a making of or behind the scenes of these episodes that will debut on Disney Plus as well. Uh, that's a great idea. Um, uh, maybe <laughs> that's that's a good that's a good idea. I mean, we you know, it was tricky in the sense that like we're in the midst of COVID, so uh, getting a ton of footage isn't easy. But you know, everybody uh, document. Yeah, I mean, it's a great idea. There's there's a lot of interesting creators involved with this. Finally, Chris from TheForce.net wanted to know, based on the range of the length of these nine episodes, was there any kind of directive given to how long or how short they needed to be? 
I think we had a range, but we broke our rules. So yeah. I think initially we were looking at, and Kanako, check my memory on this, but like, mm. I think we were like minutes. Like, yeah, we were talking about like Target is like 12 minutes, 15 minutes. And mm. then some of the uh, shorts is like, if we want to do more, so <laughs> become a little longer than that. Yeah, like in Night Jedi is a good example of that. They, they, they actually, uh, I don't think this is too, too, uh, too revealing, but they, they, they had two stories that were kind of taking place in the same, that, that were loosely connected. It was very clear uh, they had a whole, you know, mythos built in their mind and they had two shorts that in a way connected to each other and they were different proposals. And we realized... Um, we should put these together and let you tell your full story. Don't be constrained by the time. And we, we figured out how to make it work. There you have it. A big thank you to Disney and Lucasfilm. And of course, to James Waugh and Kanako for having me on to ask them questions and be able to participate in this with some of my fellow Star Wars podcasters out there. Be sure to let me know what you think of Star Wars Visions when you get the chance to see all the episodes. And we've got a lot of great coverage on Coffee with Kenobi. You can go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com right now and read my spoiler-free review. You've got this today. And then on Thursday, as I said throughout the show, myself, James Burns, and Holly Fry will look at each episode in much more detail while trying to keep it somewhat spoiler-free. However, if I were you, I would watch the episodes before I listen to the show on Thursday. And then next week on Facebook Live, we're going to rank your top five favorite episodes from Star Wars Visions, and it is not going to be easy to choose. So be sure to let us know in the CWK Cafe, our exclusive Facebook group, what you think about these episodes. Be sure to spread the word on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and all of our social media that you are enjoying Coffee with Kenobi's coverage, and I look forward to hearing what all of you think about this. Until next time, enjoy the rest of your week, and remember this is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for.